Hello, everyone. This is Vicki Matranga of IHA's Innovation Theater and Smart Talks Educational Programming. Thank you for th taking the time today to learn with IHA. We'll be hearing from Stacy Calamaras and Molly Young about winning the name game. What's the story behind a great brand name? But before we begin, a few housekeeping notes. You can ask them questions during their presentation and we'll take them at the end. Hover over the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom screen and just type in your questions. I'll be back after their presentation to engage them in a conversation. This program is being recorded and will remain on our website, theinspiredhomeshow.com. Today we're learning from Stacy Calamaras, founding partner of the Calamaras Law Office, LLC, and Molly Young, founding principal of Nametag International, Inc. They were scheduled to speak at the Innovation Theater at the Inspired Home Show in March, and they kindly offered to share their information that they would have presented at the show. But now with the added insights from recent developments in brand name controversies. Stacy Calamaris is an award-winning trademark and intellectual property attorney who has worked for some of the world's most beloved brands in more than 150 countries for clients in diverse industries. In January 2018, when she, found, she founded her namesake law firm <clears throat> and now assists small and medium-sized businesses to identify, register, protect, and commercialize their brands, both in the U.S. and abroad. Stacy has nearly 30 years combined experience, combined branding experience. For becoming a lawyer, Stacy was a brand manager and advertising director in the consumer packaged goods industry, which gave her valuable insight into the, her clients' businesses on a practical level that few other intellectual property attorneys understand. A frequent speaker on branding and intellectual property topics, just within the last year, Stacy has helped educate more than 1,300 attorneys on three continents on the trademark rules of practice, trademark, trademark clearance searches, anti-counterfeiting, and trademark enforcement, in, enforcement issues. She's joined today by Molly Young, who also has more than 30 years of strategic branding experience, working with a wide range of companies <clears throat> from startups and rising enterprises to top companies across many industries and markets. Molly specializes in the development of global brand and nomenclature strategy. She has rich experience and leadership in working with C-level and board of directors on issues related to naming, nomenclature strategy and rebranding, as well as a focus on brand equity measurement, linguistic screening, name testing and tagline development. She has assisted companies such as General Electric, 3M, Whirlpool, Pfizer, Cargill, General Motors, Land O'Lakes, Procter & Gamble, Honeywell, and numerous others, in, as well as those in our housewares market area. So we have uh, some seasoned practitioners with us today, and we'll learn a lot from them. So I'm going to sign off now and join uh, back in later, and take it away, Stacy and Molly. Oh. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Vicki, for introducing us. And Stacy and I have the great pleasure to be with you today. We were very sad to not be there in person in March, but uh, delighted to be able to connect with all of you today. And we hope that you'll find it to be uh, an interesting, engaging experience and that you'll have some good takeaways. So I'll be kicking it off by talking about some nomenclature issues, sharing some examples of naming and Stacy will then take over and talk to us about uh, trademark. And as you can guess, brand marketers need to have as their very best friend, their intellectual property attorney, because you can develop a phenomenal name, but if you cannot trademark and protect it, it's a terrible name. So we're delighted to be in tandem to, uh, to talk with you today. So Stacy, let's get started. Okay, great. We thought we'd start by just some grounding of how do you recognize a great name? These are really the five things that we look for on a global basis to help you understand, do you have a great name? Number one, that it launches the product, your service, your company today with an eye for tomorrow. Number two, you want it to be memorable. Three, that it inspires, it creates something that is engaging and inspirational for your target market. Four, 
It's trademarkable, very key. And the fifth thing is that it's linguistically appropriate. And we will touch on each one of those things as we uh, talk together today. Let's take a look at the next slide. So we thought we would put this question out to you. I'm going to show you a couple of examples of where do some of the great names come from? Let's take a look at the first one, Starbucks. So you can pop in a guess to see if you have an idea where that name originated from. Let's take a look. It actually was created from the book Moby Dick. Starbuck was actually a key character, a coffee loving sailor and mate in the book. And names have unique origins and creating a story and a name like that has had the opportunity to become a very strong global brand. Next one, Snickers. How about this, the venerable candy bar. We've had the opportunity to work with the M&M Mars company for many, many years and have in fact worked on the Snickers brand and diversifying product opportunities. But where do you think that name came from? Let's take a look. It actually is the name of the Mars family racehorse, Snickers, creating a story, creating a name, building a global brand about something that had a very unique origin. Let's look at the next one. How about this one, Cuisinart? Very close to uh, the sweet spot of all of us in the audience today in the housewares industry. Where do you think Cuisinart came from? Let's take a look. Well, actually, it was introduced in 1973, we think, at the uh, housewares show. And it's actually a combination of the word cuisine and art to become an inventive name. Cuisin art. Very fresh, very strong brand. Next one. We thought it would be helpful for you to get a grounding. And this is where Stacy and I sometimes uh, bicker back and forth in the definition of what's a descriptive name versus an inventive name. So I'm going to start from the marketing side and uh, let's take a look at descriptive names. The uh, concept of a descriptive name from a marketing perspective is when you look at that name, you understand what it's trying to convey. You understand what it says and what it means. Next one. Here are some examples. A name like Health Partners, you get a sense that that organization is somehow related to healthcare. Pop Up Bowl, a ConAgra product was designed to talk about how the packaging itself, when you put it in the microwave, popped into an actual serving bowl. And the one that Stacy and I have bantered back and forth about is bubbly. And our original thought was we put that as an image name and Stacy said, no, 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 no. It's actually a highly descriptive name because that's what it is, bubbly, busy water. So those are some examples of descriptive names. Let's take a look at the next category. These would be names that would be image names or expressive names designed to capture a, a position or an attitude. Frequently important when you're launching a brand and you want a fresh appeal. Next one. Here are some examples and many of course are right in our category. The Pampered Chef, a beautiful image oriented type of name that elevates the experience of the products. The lower left the launch of Nest, a, a beautiful innovation when introduced in the category to not talk about control or talk about monitoring, but rather get to that emotional piece of protecting your nest, taking care of your nest, meaning your home or your environment. Dirt Devil is another one, getting after the dirt, aggressively going after the cleaning mechanisms. And Organic Valley is a brand that takes us to a place, an attitude and a feeling of freshness and goodness. Let's look at the next one, which is a category that we call inventive or coined, or from a legal perspective, an arbitrary type of name. Here's some examples. Names uh, like Swiffer. Example of Swiffer is so interesting because the origins of Swiffer really came about, it, it created a new category, but it's interesting because the name was devised to emulate the sound. So think about this. Think about the concept of sweeping and the concept of the early origin of the Swiffer products were more broom related. And the sound that a broom makes when it's being used is swift, 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 
Swiffer, Swiffer, Swiffer. Thus, the origin of really beautifully inventive name. Spam, of course, spiced ham, Brillo, and the venerable OXO OXO brand. Words that don't mean anything, but have become incredibly powerful, powerful brands because they're inventive. They're a beautiful way and typically used when you're trying to break through a category where perhaps competitively everything is descriptive or everything is sounding very similar, utilizing an inventive name can be a very powerful way to break through with a message of we are different, we are here, pay attention to this brand. Let's look at the next slide. So we thought it was interesting, of course, all of us are in the thick of this, this we wanted to talk about what do you do during the COVID scenario, specifically related to brand. The next slide talks about a brand that was hit very hard and amazingly hard, and that's Corona. So early on in this pandemic, and in fact, the end of February, first part of March, it was deemed uh, to be highly confusing. There were actually almost 40% of Americans were saying they wouldn't drink Corona beer because they had an association that Corona beer was related to the Corona virus, which in so many ways was also a push to moving to a different kind of name of COVID-19. So something that can happen, absolutely no uh, control over it, a brand having, uh, being, being tainted by the virus. It just, it's happened and the brand has had to take aggressive, aggressive moves to protect that. Let's look at the next piece. There's uh, quite a bit of global research that has been done. And for those of you that are brand marketers, we thought this was very interesting and in that there was a study that was just completed uh, not too long ago and 12,000 people were surveyed globally. And the issue was all about what did they expect from their brands during this pandemic and then post pandemic. And some very uh, interesting things came out. And one is that there is a high dependence upon brands to deliver during the pandemic. We know that from the food chain, supply chain, we know that from cleaning brands like Clorox, Lysol, even global brands like Ecolab getting in and building brand promises around cleaning. But 63% uh, of the market did not think that their country could make it through without brands playing a critical role. And we saw that firsthand with the food chain and the ability for brands to step up and deliver food into the grocery stores, food shelves to be uh, restocked, very imperative. Let's look at the next one. A couple more thoughts on that. 55% of this audience thought brands were responding more quickly than their government and therefore the trust level in their brands was going up. But the most important thing here is that 86% of this global audience said that their brands were the safety net. They looked to their brands to step up and to assist if their governments weren't able to do that. So why does that matter in what we're talking about today? It matters a lot. The message that your brands are conveying is imperative right now. It's important to deliver that message with integrity. It's important from a legal perspective, uh, Stacy's purview, to make sure what you say is uh, something that you can say legitimately and be protected by. Important to remember. Let's look at the next slide. And that's all about what happened. And this is just amazing. And, and many of you have seen this of what's happening with people moving home and literally cooking more. So Neela, CEO of Crate and Barrel said in April, Crate and Barrel sold more bread makers than they sold in the entire year of 2019, more bread makers. So it's, it's not just Crate and Barrel that is experiencing this. And what that has driven is what are these new products that we can bring? What are the answers that we can deliver to consumers that are desperate for help and innovation in, in different areas? Let's look at the next one. And you can see that even a, a bankrupt company or a company going through bankruptcy, that being JCPenney, is really trying to deliver to a brand and creating a new brand, a private label brand of Linden Street to try to salvage a position, to try to carve out an opportunity to continue to perform in the marketplace. You'll see this both in store and moving aggressively to an online type of execution. The next one we'll look at 
is um, the proprietary piece of how do you get people to come back? So for the hotel chains, how do you get a guest or someone that would have been a frequent traveler or an occasional traveler to want to come back and to trust that they'll be okay? Well, you do that by teaming with another brand. And in this case, Hilton, a very strong joint venture with the Lysol Corporation to create the clean stay brand. It's that promise that the experience will deliver uh, something that will be clean and you can feel comfortable. The Drury Hotel linked with Ecolab to develop a brand of travel happy again, clean and safe. Brands that we wouldn't have thought about three months ago when we were supposed to be speaking together are now in place and doing well. Let's look at the next. This is Tracy's or Stacy's area and she's going to take over and talk all about trademark and then we'll get back together. Great. Thanks, Molly. Um, I think that it's really important information, uh, especially when Molly talks about the importance of brands, especially now. We know from the last recession um, how important brands were and the surge that brands um, that brands enjoyed during the last recession and the surge that trademarks um, experienced during the last recession. And we don't expect to see any different type of activity now as a result of COVID. And for those of you on the webinar today who are true marketers, who tend to see legal as the department of no, we hope that by doing this collaboration, you can see how important it is for both the creative service agencies and legal to work together and how we can, we can play a role. Um, because as Molly rightly pointed out, your brand or the new name that you're coming up with really has no value if it isn't protectable in, in your market. So let's talk just a little bit about what a trademark is and, and how we can go about protecting it to give you a little bit of background. So let's start first with really what a trademark is. It protects a company's reputation when you really boil it down. It's a word, it can be a phrase, it can be a symbol, it can be a logo, it can be a combination of those things but it's really used to identify your company's goods and services and distinguish them from your competitors. Now there's many types of trademarks. Uh, trademarks can be sounds, they can be scents, they can be various things, but we're talking about brands. So for the most part, we're in the business of, of, of protecting your word, your tagline, maybe even your logo design. Now it's important to know that your business name or your domain name, those aren't necessarily trademarks. Now when I say that, what I mean is that the fact that you've just registered your business name with the Secretary of State Office or secured your domain name with your domain name registrar, that doesn't give you any trademark rights. And you can understand why, because we have, we have 50, 50 Secretary of State offices, and you could have the same business name registered from state to state. And so a lot of smaller businesses get confused by this. They come to me and they say, but I registered my business name with the Secretary of State's office. Well, that's a great start, but how are you going to be using that business name? If we look at some of the big branded companies like the Procter & Gamble Company, and we could sit here and argue whether the P&G moniker rises to the level of trademark, but let's look first at the entity. The Procter & Gamble company is the entity, the basket, if you will, that houses some of the, the brands that we all know and love and trust, like Charmin, like Tide, those brands that we know, Oil Valet, Crest, all of those brands, they are the company that brings us those brands. So your company name doesn't really matter, but it gets confusing because you look at a company like Nike, Nike Inc., and then Nike is also the brand name. So it can be very confusing and it all depends on how we use it how you intend to use it because trademarks are all based on use in commerce. So we have a 10 year term here in the United States, but the reason why trademarks are so valuable and brands are so valuable is from a legal perspective, 
trademarks can be renewed indefinitely as long as the trademark is used. And that's why companies are bought and sold. It's because of the value of the brand, the value of the trademark. So what is really the purpose of a trademark? Well, it's a shorthand way for consumers to identify the products and services. Um, I used to work in consumer packaged goods, so think about it, especially now as so much is online, how do you know you're buying the right product? Well, we identify it by what we in legal parlance call the trade dress. Um, do you intend to buy Cheerios? Well, how do you know? Well, we know because it's that yellow box of the round oat cereal. That's how we know. So that's really the purpose of trademarks. It's a shorthand way for consumers to identify that product or service at the shelf or in the store, whether you're selling durable goods, no matter what you're selling. And really at its core, it communicates a brand promise. Let's look at these two brands, FedEx. If you have to mail a package and it absolutely positively has to be there by 10 a.m. tomorrow, there's no way in the world you're gonna go to the post office. I'm not. I have no confidence that my package will be there tomorrow or two days from now or a week from now. I just don't know. But I know that with FedEx, it'll be there. Why? Because they've told me that. They've ingrained that into their branding. So I'm going to choose FedEx. Now, maybe you'll choose UPS. What, whatever carrier you'll choose, it's because you believe in the promise that they've created behind their brand. What about Crock-Pot, a, a, a brand from the, from the housewares industry? Well, Crock-Pot has been around since the 70s. I mean, it's the original slow cooker. And it, it enabled, I mean, whether this is you know, appropriate still in our market, it enabled a whole, a whole segment of the population to be able to work and still put dinner on the table for their families. I mean, like it or not, that's part of Crock-Pot's history. It's part of their brand identity, and they're the original. They're the first, right? Cuisinart and, and Hamilton Beach and a bunch of other brands make slow cookers, but in, in my house, I have a Crock-Pot. That's the only brand I want in my house because I believe in the brand promise of Crock-Pot. So that's the purpose of trademarks. What is the scope of trademark protections? We're gonna talk about this, but they're territorial in nature. What does that mean? Well, there's no such thing as a worldwide trademark. Um, there are ways to secure trademark protection in other countries, but you have, to, you have to secure trademark protection in each and every country in which you intend to use them. So when you secure a trademark in the United States, that's the only place in which you have protection. But more important than that, you only have protection for the goods and services for which you uh, have used them, for which you've applied for them, and which you've secured registration. Now, there are exceptions to that. There are famous trademarks. Um, but I want to illustrate that point with these marks I show here. I like talking about these because it's funny, but it, it drives the point home. We, we assess trademark infringement from a legal perspective based on the concept of likely confusion. Now, Ace Hardware, which is a national um, hardware store chain, and Ace Bandages, those both coexist as registered trademarks. The reason why is, is you're never gonna walk into an Ace Hardware store, let's hope we can all do that again sometime soon, and you're not going to ask the person helping you, oh my gosh, my son or my daughter sprained their ankle, you know, where are those elastic bandages that I can use to, you know, hold their, you know, hold their ankle together, their wrist together to, you know, hold it in place? They're gonna look at you like you're not. Conversely, if you walk into a Walgreens or a CVS and, and are looking for the screwdriver aisle, they're not going to have them, right? So you're not going to be confused by that. Similarly, with Dove chocolates or ice cream bars, if they, as they've expanded their chocolate into other goods, and Dove beauty bar, a soap, you're not going to be confused and you're not going to walk into Lowe's or Home Depot and, and mistakenly think that you're being taken on a flight to Boston, right? Delta Airlines and Delta faucets can coexist. And as we already mentioned, trademarks are a very valuable IP asset 
for companies. That's why we protect them. So this is a very important chart. Why, why seek trademark registration? It, it, it can be, it's not, it's not expensive to seek one trademark registration, but when you're a company that has a number of marks, it can become expensive, especially if you're doing business globally. So why do it? Well, it's an important IP asset. We already talked about that. We talked about how they can last indefinitely as long as they're used in commerce, um, but they're required if you want to take down social media infringers. You need a registered trademark number to do that. If you want to combat counterfeiters, you need a trademark registration. You can register your trademark with Customs and Border Patrol and, um, and you want that registration number. And if you want to sell your wares in an Amazon seller store, you need that trademark registration. You don't want to rely just on your common law rights. But it's super helpful if you're seeking an investment for a startup or a new business. It may not be necessary, but it will be helpful. Those investors will want to see it. I can send a cease and desist letter. If you don't have one, I can rely on what we call your common law rights, but it's a lot more impactful if you already have the registration. And same thing in bringing a lawsuit. I can do it if you don't have the registration, but it's more expensive, it's more difficult. And a registration will increase the value if you want to enter into any license agreement or, as we've been discussing, if you wish to sell your business. Now, Molly talked a little bit about the different types of marks. I just want to explain the hierarchy uh, briefly from a legal perspective. The, the types of marks above the line are, are always entitled to registration because they're what we call distinctive. So a fanciful mark is at the top of the, of the list, and those are the, the most enforceable. They're coined terms. They don't exist until a company thinks of them. So they're made up, they create, they, 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 they're the most expensive to create that link between the mark and the, the goods and services in the mind of the consumer. So it takes a huge marketing budget. And so those are marks like Exxon, and OXO, um, Kodak as well, um, even though that brand didn't continue to evolve as the technology did, those are very strong marks, but those companies spent a fortune to create that connection between their brands and consumers. Arbitrary is also, very, they're very strong marks, but those are a little bit different. It's where you take an existing word in the English language and you use it, you kind of turn it on its head. So where apple isn't protectable for fruit or certainly not for an apple, if you turn it and you start using it in connection with computer goods, or now what the apple empire is, entertainment overall, it becomes a very strong mark. And it's really the case study for how to create an arbitrary mark. And nest even, I would argue, is an arbitrary mark as well and a very strong trademark. Absolutely. Now there's a difference between suggestive and descriptive. Um, brand people love descriptive marks. Marketing people love descriptive marks, but it describes what it does, Stacy. Yeah, I get it. But unfortunately, you see it's below the line. Um, you don't have exclusive rights to use a descriptive mark absent something we call secondary meaning. And that takes, that, that means other people can use your mark. But it's, if it's suggestive, um, then it gets above the line treatment. So let me try to explain the difference between the two. A suggestive mark doesn't describe your, the features of your brand. And so taking an example from the housewares industry, I love to cook. So I use my pots and pans constantly. So wherever, pots and pans, right? It's a wonderful thought that you would never have to replace your pots and pans, right? But those of you who cook like I do know that that's just not true, especially if you use them. Um, but wherever doesn't describe what the cookware does. What the cookware does is it enables us to cook. It's aspirational. It helps us think, wow, this is awesome, right? My pots and pans are gonna last forever. It's evocative, okay. So copper tone is another example 
um, you know, for those of us who grew up in the sunbathing era, you know, copper tone is a sunscreen. It protects us from the sun. By applying the suntan lotion, that doesn't mean we'll have copper toned skin. It's, it's, a, it's something aspirational that we hope we'll have. So that's the difference. Descriptive marks are very different. Some examples of marks that have been held descriptive lately, and they're becoming very elaborate, um, especially out of the hospitality industry where I represent a lot of clients. We have marks like the joint for restaurant services mm -hmm. and the salad station for restaurants, um, your cloud for cloud computing services. That one's kind of obvious and the babysitting company for caregiving services. So you can see it doesn't just have to be, you know, one or two words, but these are marks that were all refused by the USPTO. And a generic mark, these also have become very elaborate lately. No one's entitled to own them. When I was a young attorney, it was very simple. It was apple for apple, toothpaste for toothpaste. Now we have a plethora of generic cases coming down um, and they're very elaborate. Things like skinny belt for belts. I personally don't agree with this decision. I think that's descriptive all day long. We have, um, you know, the corporate law group for legal services, which makes all the sense in the world to me. But the point here is, is when you misuse your trademark, you can lose your rights and the mark can become generic. Escalator used to be a registered trademark and it is no longer. Um, it's, it's generic. And aspirin was an acronym uh, for the chemical compound. I never knew that till I went to law school. So using your mark properly, which is where the brand team and the legal department need to work <clears throat> together to make sure that the mark is used properly. <laughs> so this is why we search, right? This is where People like Molly and me, we partner together because when, uh, when a creative services agency comes up with a lot of concepts or you internally come up with a lot of concepts, you want to make sure that, that the name you're using is eligible for registration and you're not stepping on someone else's toes. So we want to make sure that we can search it because changing a brand name many years later, it's a huge distraction, you can lose your reputation, uh, not your reputation, you can lose your goodwill and you can lose kind of the customer base that you've built up. And when in times like these where either you have financial um, difficulties or limited resources, searching can actually help to head off an expensive lawsuit and save you money in the long run. So Molly's gonna, I'm gonna send it back over to Molly to talk about changing your your name if you need to exactly what we just said we may not want to do but there might be times when you when you intentionally need to do that right and that's exactly the case stacy and, and something that uh, sometimes strategically it's a very wise thing to do as you expand your grant your brands and your business opportunity so let's take a look at a shot of some companies and products that have had to change their names so this, these six reasons would be very typical reasons of why a company or a product may wish to change their name. And you may be facing this with some of your own brands. So an example of the current name maybe doesn't effectively really capture the scope or the desired impression of your business. So we can think even in our industry, housewares, and think about Sunbeam began as the Chicago Flexible Shaft Company and evolved scope change, new name needed. Another situation that comes up very frequently is if an organization is merging or is acquiring another company and that one of the two names is not appropriate to continue to represent the combined organization going forward. So GMAC uh, changing their name to Ally to represent that. Stacy knows very well that trademark infringement is a big deal. And if you don't do your searching properly in the beginning, many organizations fall into this situation as was evidenced by Exelon needing to change their name because they were infringing upon another organization in their sector, changing their name to Excel Energy. Geographic expansion is another, another big deal. So Panera literally began as the St. Louis Bread Company. 
What's important to think about as marketers when you're launching your business, when you're launching your product, is to be forward thinking and to work closely with your IP attorney to think about this. Where will you be in five years? Where will you be in 10 years? Where do you want to be? To pick a name in the beginning that you can grow with that you don't grow out of. Another situation is a business spinoff and Honeywell went through this and spinning off uh, one of their divisions to be a standalone company, that being residual. Something that's happening, I would say very frequently, uh, especially right now, is a scenario where your name, and it might be a wonderful name, the, this is with the T-Mobile organization, that for situations, environments, it's not such a wonderful name any longer. So T-Mobile, AT AT&T, excuse me, had the ISIS wallet. That was the name of their credit card performance piece. Obviously, ISIS being a terrorist group, they needed to go through a name change. It's now called the soft card. Another example that we all have seen in the last few days are brands like Aunt Jemima, Uncle Ben's, Mrs. Butterworth, and other brands that are literally being forced to take a look at brand heritage, brand messaging in light of social justice issues. Many of those brands have determined that it's time for a name change and are proceeding through that. It can happen and it's important as marketers to pay very close attention to these six elements as you manage your brands going forward. So we thought it would be fun. Uh, we'll do this very quickly. These uh, five companies, very strong today, very strong in their day, they had to go through a name change for various reasons. So take a minute and uh, jot down a guess of what you think their current names are. David and Jerry's Guide to the World Wide Web, Huff Doll and Dusters, a very successful crop dusting company, Parsons Band Cutter and Self Feeder, the company called Back Rub, and the company called, or the product called Quick Cut. Well, today, here are their names Yahoo, Huff Doll and Dusters, very successful crop dusting, outgrew that business to become Delta Airlines. Maytag began as Parsons Band Cutter and Self Feeder. Google literally began as Back Rub. And Ginsu, of course, began as Quick Cut. So brands do evolve, companies do evolve, and very frequently it's a time to make a change, fix the name situation, and yet fix it for a future that allows for not having to go through that again and picking a brand that you can grow with and sustain. Let's take a look at the next one. One of the things we mentioned earlier is how imperative it is that your brand is speaking the right message. Well, it's critically important if you're a global brand or if your brand, even a domestic US brand, making sure US Spanish is addressed in your uh, consideration. Here's some examples that are true examples of global brands that didn't do this. So Clairol launched a curling iron called Mist Stick because it had a liquid, wonderful curling element to it in Germany. However, they didn't do any linguistic screening only to find out that Mist actually is German slang for manure. So it's like putting manure in your hair. Really, really very pleasant. Ikea, Ikea, the wonderful Ikea retailer, had a, a workbench on wheels called Fartful and literally had a little bit of trouble with that in terms of bringing that to the marketplace. And uh, Kentucky Fried Chicken, China is a tough, tough market at times from a linguistic perspective because the uh, different structure of the alphabet, but the finger looking good tagline was not executed properly in uh, using Chinese characters and it literally translated in one usage to eat your fingers off. So we, we share these with you because it's important as brand marketers to think about protecting your brand from a global perspective, protecting your brand from a trademark perspective, and what can happen if you don't. And Stacy is going to give you a couple of quick war stories and, and then we'll take your questions. Yeah, th thanks. Thanks, Molly. Yeah, China's really difficult. You always want to uh, get a native speaker when you're, when you're going into China. I, I personally have been involved in a lot of debacles in China. 
Um, so these are just fun. We're just going to go through these very quickly so we can wrap up and get you on with your day. Um, so the World, the World Wildlife Fund, the WWF, I'm sure you've all seen this logo on the left here, was founded in 1961. And um, the WWE, right, the wrestlers, that was originally founded as the World Wrestling Federation. Um, and the, the World Wildlife Fund and the World Wrestling Federation had an agreement together because the World Wildlife Fund did not want the wrestlers using the acronym WWF, and the wrestlers breached that agreement in 1994, and so as a result, um, the World Wildlife Fund asked them to rebrand and the wrestlers did, and that's how the WWE was born in 2002. So uh, while I'm not privy to all the details there, I'm certain uh, the World Wildlife Fund, the pandas here on the left, argued that they had quite some notoriety and fame um, of their mark, which I would argue is, is accurate. So um, I wouldn't want my um, conservation fund to be associated with uh, wrestlers for entertainment. So that's actually how the WWE that we all know and love or whatever your feelings are about it was born in 2002. That actually was a trademark um, issue. So a lot of people think that only small companies are targeted, that they're, they're bullied, that they're the ones who always have to change their names. Well, it's not true. Nestle um, recently, just a, a couple of weeks ago, lost a lawsuit in the European Union over its um, it's Incredible Burger. They lost to Impossible Burger, who is the much smaller entity. Nestle, of course, is the largest food company in the world. Um, and they will have to rebrand their Incredible Burger in Europe to Sensational Burger is what they've said they will rebrand. They are appealing the decision. And they, also, they had previously had to change the name of this product in the US to Awesome Burger. So they will not have consistency across the continents. This also often happens for large brands where um, we strive to have the same name uh, worldwide. It is not always possible. So um, just know that large brands are not immune from having to change their names. And I wanted to share this example with you, A, because it's very recent, and B, as evidence that it's not just small companies that have to change their names. Um, so this was an interesting case. Milk Bar, um, those of you who may follow um, um, uh, chefs. So Milk Bar was founded by an award-winning chef in 2008. She um, has locations in New York, California, Vegas, Washington, D.C., and Boston. And here in Chicago, where I'm located, uh, she sued JoJo's Milk Bar in Chicago. She objected to the use of Milk Bar um, I, I don't, again, I'm not privy to all the facts of this case. If you look at these two photos, there is some similarity in the scripting. Mm -hmm. This, for me, as a trademark attorney, is a very interesting case because there was no registration owned by the New York Milk Bar for the term milk or milk bar, but litigation is very expensive, and so JoJo's uh, caved and decided to change their name to JoJo's Shake Shack in March of earlier, uh, just a few months ago of this year. So um, that was an interesting one. And um, I think our last one is Wawa. If you have ever been out east, you know that Wawa is a convenience store chain out east. They own about 850 stores all the way from um, New Jersey down to Florida, I think. They objected to this use of Dawa, which I, I kind of agree with. Um, I think the issue here was, is even though Dawa had just a single location, Wawa had two stores within five miles of this single location. Um, so they entered into a settlement agreement. We don't know all the details, but it was reported that Dawa will change its name. So we look at a number of different factors when we, when we look at infringement. Location is certainly one of them. I can see how consumers would have been confused mm -hmm. on, on this one. Right. So right. we'll leave you with some, some tips um, and then we'll take your questions. So um, we just, 
It's important to create a brand that's memorable and that resonates with your target market. You want to think very globally about your brand. Um, you always want to use your brands properly. So your brands, your trademarks, they should always be used as adjectives. You want to use the proper symbol, either the TM symbol before your mark is registered or the circle R after your mark is registered with the USPTO after your brand name. And you want to register your most valuable trademarks. Look, not every company has the budget to register every mark everywhere in the world. So you want to talk with your trademark attorney about what makes the most sense for your company. And you always want to make sure you police your marks to be able to ensure that any unauthorized activity is dealt with uh, appropriately. So we thank you so much for your time. It was such a pleasure to be with you today. Um, there's our contact information if you want to reach out to us. And um, we are delighted to take any questions that you may have for us in the time remaining. Thank you, Stacy and Molly. That was fascinating. Uh, your presentation was packed with so many insights and examples of well-known brands. And uh, your stories about the misfires on naming and international markets were uh, especially thought-provoking. Uh, I, I was pretty moved by your statement that during COVID, brands were more trustworthy than, uh, considered more trustworthy um, than the government for providing us a safety net and integrity. That was an interesting insight. Mm -hmm. So we do have several questions from the audience. Um, during the name selection process, um, how would teams create buy-in uh, throughout the team and company leadership? Um, I can take that one. And, and I think what's very important is that uh, brand is more important than ever. And so what we're seeing in our client companies is that the most senior leadership is looking at brand more closely than they ever have before and getting involved in, in, in branding. And so one of the ways to think about how do you keep your teams engaged and how do you keep the approval process moving through even before you get into some of the legal screening is ensuring that the most senior leadership or anyone that will touch your name decision making is interviewed early on to understand what are their hopes and goals for this name? What does it need to deliver and why? And also to make sure that your legal work is done and done well before you present names to a broader team. Because the worst case scenario is you present names, your team falls in love, and you find out you can't have them because they're not legally available. So we strongly urge our teams to do the legal work early, partner early with people like Stacy to make sure that that work is done well. And then as you present uh, throughout your organization, you have a brand that you can uh, run with once the selection is made. I see, that's a good point. I wanted to bring legal into the naming uh, discussion. Um, how, how does a company ensure that they truly have a global brand? Well, yeah, that's, that's tough. Part of that, yeah, it, it is. And, and, and the piece that we do is uh, making sure that even strategically before you do anything from a creative front, you understand the geographic footprint that you do business in today and into the future and to identify who those customers are and prospects are and build the name around that group. We talked about linguistic and Stacey, you can speak about the global legal aspect. Yeah, it, is, it isn't always possible. While, while it, is, it is always the hope and during the screening process, we can certainly, we can certainly try for that. Um, it, it, just, it just isn't always possible. Um, we have a, there, are di there are different legal systems set up in different jurisdictions. And so while our system is based on use and the first to use, um, almost every other jurisdiction in the world is based on first to file. Mm -hmm. And so we, we see this especially in China. And so making sure that especially um, for, for, for large companies who have a global footprint, that they don't make any press announcements too early. So Viagra, just as, as a for instance, right? And I, I know it's not relevant for this audience, but it's an interesting case study. When Viagra first launched, they did a big press release. You know, it was, I mean, it was a revolutionary drug. Why wouldn't you tout it? But unfortunately, they, they went to the press too early before they had all their trademarks locked and loaded around the world. And it ended up costing them um, hundreds of millions of dollars to buy back the trademark in China. 
because mm -hmm. any any just ordinary person, right? Someone like Molly could run to the trademark office in China and secure the trademark in her name. Now there mm -hmm. are legal maneuvers to to cancel that trademark, but it is it's very difficult, especially in a jurisdiction like China. So. Um, it's part, while, while, while there's a strategy on the brand side, there's also a strategy on the legal side. And so for any business, even a small business who plans to manufacture in China, um, we, we, we just want to understand that. So, so the conversations, even though I know it's not fun talking with lawyers and it can be scary, it is really important to understand the strategy so that we can help you in, in identifying the countries to go to first. And while it may not seem like it's ideal, Lysol, for instance, right, which is a very popular brand right now, a company I used to work for, Lysol is not called Lysol in Europe. Right? It's right. a billion dollar brand. It is called Dettol in Europe. Right. So, I mean, even huge brands that are very well known, that are super important, they're called different things in different parts of the world. So it is still possible to be highly successful and have a different name elsewhere. Uh, that's really interesting. Um, so then, sort of building on that, when somebody submits a trademark application, um, how long does it take to get the trademark registered? And then similarly, how long do they have to wait before they can start using that trademark? Yeah, so those are both excellent questions. So it, 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 it can depend, of course, on what is encountered, but provided we do everything right on the front end, look, the government is the government. There isn't much we can do to rush the process. Um, typically, if there are no issues, it takes about nine to 11 months to secure a trademark registration if the mark is currently in use. If it's not currently in use, it can take a little bit longer. Um, but provided we do the vetting, um, and we do a proper search and we don't identify any issues, um, someone can start using the mark right away. There really is no issue with that. Um, I don't recommend that, that people do that on their, on their own if they haven't conducted a search. Obviously anyone can choose to do anything that they want, but if they haven't conducted a full availability search, there could be risk in doing that, but nothing stops you. Your rights um, to the trademark attach when you start using the mark um, but whether or not there would be an issue with that from other parties objecting, it's impossible to know if you haven't completed a search. Um, but yeah, the, the government does, the process does take some time. So um, we, can't, we can't really rush that. There has been, just full disclosure, there has been an exception made right now by the USPTO. It's unprecedented for companies who are working on actual treatments to help treat COVID. So there is a fast track available for that, but that, that's a rare exception. So pharmaceutical companies, people working on therapeutics, those can be fast tracked at the moment. I see. Um, on one of your uh, bullet point lists, you showed um, TM and Circle R. What yes. are the differences between those and are, are they interchangeable? They're not interchangeable. So uh, the TM symbol is used when, while your application is pending or when you are relying on what we call common law rights, if you don't ever intend to apply, the circle R symbol is only used once you receive your certificate of registration from the trademark office. Uh, using it without a certificate of registration from the trademark office is considered fraud um, and should only be used when you have your lovely gold, gold sealed uh, certificate of registration from the trademark office. Um, I see. And not using it after you have your certificate of registration can impact your ability to collect damages in an infringement suit. So it is important. You don't have to make the change like that hour or that day or that week, but um, especially if you sell durable goods or consumer goods, you just, you want to make the change as soon as practical. Oh yeah. That's a good point that it must be used in order to um, be recognized. Okay. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Okay, so then um, you also mentioned something about the Secretary of State when you were talking. Um, if a company is filed with the Secretary of State, what is the additional trademark need? need? So they're just different, right? So it's, it's sort of like, think of it this way. It's sort of like changing your name after you get married mm -hmm. for, for a woman. So just because you've, you've changed your name, you still have to file all the other documents with 
without, so just because you've gotten married and maybe you notify your children's school that you now want to be called Stacy Johnson until you file all the documents, it's, it's, it's not official. So um, I try to explain it to people this way, right? It kind of doesn't matter what your company name is, right? So my company name could be Stacy and Molly are best friends, LLC, right? It's a basket. That's all it is. It's the basket where our brands are gonna live. It's, it's a person, if you will. The corporation is the person. The brand is the, the product or the service that we sell. Now, it, it, it gets less confusing for business owners when the company name and the brand are different. It gets much more confusing when the company name and the brand are the same. So right. if, if your company name is the same as your brand, the business registration at the Secretary of State means nothing. We still have to do a search and see if the brand is available for you to use as a trademark. But just because you registered with the Secretary of State, you don't own anything from a trademark perspective. I see. Necessarily. I see. Okay. Well, <clears throat> that looks like it's about it. So um, I wanted to thank you again for your wonderful presentation. There's a lot of meat on the bone here for people to uh, dig into, chew into. So thank you very much and for the recent updates on, uh, on, on controversies uh, going on in the marketplace. Um, I encourage our audience to keep in touch with Stacy and Molly. It's uh, great that your information's on the screen. Stacy's in the Chicago area, Molly's in Minneapolis, <clears throat> and they'll be happy to get acquainted with you. Their program will remain on our website so you can revisit and share the information with your colleagues. Uh, the webinars appear under our education tab on our website, theinspiredhomeshow.com. We've hosted many excellent programs in May and June, and so please check the listing on our website. And thanks for joining us today. This is Vicki Matranga saying thank you for everyone for being with us today, for our speakers and our audience. And I hope our audience will be back for our next presentation tomorrow on sustainable plastics at 2 p.m. back on the same channel. So uh, thank you again, Molly and Stacy, and um, have a great day. Thank you, Vicki. Thank you, everyone.